All right, folks, how you doing? My name is Tim Black. I have a very special guest today. He is a veteran. He is an activist. He's also running in New York's 9th District. His name is Isaiah James. Isaiah James, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good, sir. Thank you for having me on. Man, I know you are pressed for time. You got a lot going on. You got this thing happening. Uh, it's an election, right? Yeah. On Tuesday, there's <laughs> an election. My on election Tuesday. On Tuesday. So, so uh, I, I told some viewers of mine, I said, you know, I'm going to get James on, Mr. James on. They said, well, you better hurry up and do it. I said, why? He said, well, you know, Tuesday. I'm like, oh, my goodness. So uh, we reached out to James. We was able to get him here. And now that I have him, I want to jump right into it. Mr. James, I see that you're challenging someone who is uh, considered some in some circles to be progressive, Yvette Clark. Give me a reason why uh, James, Isaiah James, is the person that should take her seat. Well, I'm telling you something. My grandmother, who just recently passed, used to always say, "My my family's Jamaican, and my grandmother immigrated from Jamaica to Pasagula, Mississippi, in the in the 30s. And my mother was born down there in a little sharecropping town. They were sharecroppers. And I remember my grandmother would always tell me, "All skin folk ain't kin folk. Mm. You know what I mean? Just because you look like me doesn't mean you're fighting for me. And the reason why Isaiah James should take her place is because Isaiah James has these lived experiences. Isaiah James." knows what it's like to walk out of the door and look like the suspect just because of my blackness and my six foot eight sides. Isaiah James knows what it's like to struggle with mental health issues because after my three tours of war and being wounded in combat, I almost committed suicide. Isaiah James knows what it's like to have a loved one with a pre-existing condition because my wife, as beautiful and lovely as she is, is in, the, in and out of the hospital all the time. Isaiah James knows what it's like to have hundreds of thousand dollars worth of student loan debt or family members who still aren't citizens and all these things. Isaiah James is one of, is an everyday average working person. And Isaiah James is not running to be a politician. He's running to be a public servant, which we are very, very short supply of right now. And that's one of the things that really drew me to you, James, is that when I heard you speak, brother, uh, I felt the sense of sincerity and, and purity uh, in your message. I felt that it was unbridled realness, and I think that's something that's sorely missing as well. In this crowded field, I'm looking at a lot of people running against you, James, and I'm really concerned because I don't feel that same sense when I hear them speak. What is it going to take at this, la at this late juncture for you to get where you need to be? It's just for people to come out and vote, you know, if folks are apprehensive about going out and actually voting in person, filling out those absentee ballots, they 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 uh, requested from the state of New York. But this is the thing. Folks are like, well, Isaiah hasn't raised as much money. Isaiah doesn't have... Listen, if you equate money to votes, then you, my friend, are part of the problem. Mm -hmm. That is the system we are trying to beat on the Democratic side, is taking, is divorcing money from votes. So yeah, folks have, have raised more than me, but let's ask ourselves a few questions. One... This is one of the poorest congressional districts in the country. Folks ain't raising $400,000 from Flatbush and East Flatbush and Brownsville and bed and Crown Heights. They ain't getting that from this neighborhood. So where are they getting that from? They're getting that from Wall Street. Now, listen, whatever those investors invest in your campaign, they want it back tenfold because they've been doing it for 20, 30 years. They're not giving you money because they like you. They're giving you money because they want something. And whatever they want is not good for black and brown people in my community. That's number one. Number two, Folks should vote for me and folks can vote for me because they know, like I said, I'm running to be a public servant. And like you said before, you see this thing on my chest right here? This was given to me by the President, President Barack Obama. This is a combat infantry badge. Mm. If you look this up, it says that you have faced the enemy and you could have died and you did your duty. I've been shot, been shot at, been blown up, hit with RPGs and rockets and mortars. I've been literally on the brink of death's door, been wounded in combat. What the hell is somebody going to do to me that hasn't already been done to me? I'm not afraid to speak the truth. I'm not afraid to speak truth to power because the systems that we have in place obviously aren't working. You see 40 million people out of work. You see thousands of people, millions across this world who are in protest. And it's no longer just black people, you know, speaking in our own echo chamber of pain. It's now everybody across the world. I've been there, done that, and got the T-shirt to prove it. So I have no problem standing up for what I believe in and the people I'm fighting for. I love it. I love it. You know, you know, when, when we, we can get into the specifics about his campaign, ladies and gentlemen, we will talk about his platform. Very impressive platform. Very progressive platform. One of the most progressive platforms I've seen, and I've been covering politics for almost 10 years now. But I just want people to realize that the sense of urgency is right now. If you want a brother, a, a fighter, a, a, a 
act an activist like James in there fighting for the people of New York uh, in Brooklyn, then we need to get behind this campaign right now. Go to IsaiahForCongress.com, IsaiahForCongress.com. Now, let's talk about the Democratic Socialist Movement. Let's talk about uh, your platform a little bit just to flesh it out, James. Absolutely. So Black folks need to understand that we come from a collectivist background. You can look at all the African proverbs. It takes a village to raise a child. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. You know, look at the, look at the many hands make light work. That's our background as black people. That's how we survived hundreds of years in slavery is because we leaned on each other. And we have to have a government that does that, that invests in its people instead of the powerful corporations. So folks are all, Martin Luther King talked about democratic socialism. And remember, Martin Luther King was one of the most hated people while he was alive. They did a Quinnipiac poll, I believe it was. And folks actually hated Martin Luther King Jr. But now he's revered. And the same stuff he was talking about, the same stuff Brother Malcolm was talking about, Bobby Seale, Fannie Lou Hamer, all of them were talking about is what we're seeing right now in this country. My father, who came to Brooklyn in 1970 on a guest worker program to pick apples, mm. all he wanted was a better life and, and racial justice inequality. His son is standing here right now fighting that same damn fight. I will be damned if my son or my daughter has to fight that same fight. The greatest tree you can plant is one whose shade you will never sit in. I'm sitting here right now and you are sitting where you are right now because somebody somewhere sacrificed for us that didn't even know us. Somebody got bit by a dog. Somebody's skin got ripped off by a water hose. Somebody sat at a lunch counter when they were told no because they knew they were making a difference for some little black kid, some little black boy or girl down the line. And that's what this is about. That's what this race is about. It's about fighting for people right now, but also fighting for unborn generations to come. What's life like in Brooklyn for those people who are living paycheck to paycheck, Isaiah? What are, what are their struggles and how can you help them? It's not even paycheck to paycheck anymore. We ain't mm. even getting those paychecks anymore. 40 million people are out of work. I see the same homeless brothers and sisters every single day. And it breaks my damn heart because I see new police cars every single day. I see a new helicopter. And I'm like, I see a new high rise building going up. And I'm like, what is happening? You know, on Flatbush Avenue is poverty. You go one avenue over to Bedford Avenue, there's million dollar homes. That doesn't happen by accident. You can go to the projects, the Albany houses and see into the park, the $5 million brownstones. And it's the same district. That doesn't happen by accident. That happens on purpose. Communities like mine have been systematically disinvested from for the last 50, 60 years. And it's time to make a change like that. People are struggling. People are losing their homes every day. People are getting evicted every day. People are uh, committing suicide because they can't take it. Right now, Central Brooklyn is the epicenter of coronavirus in New York City. You think that's by accident? Or is it because our public hospitals have been defunded and defunded over and over again, even before coronavirus hit? You know why there's so much police brutality in Central Brooklyn? Because we're the most heavily policed. You know what I mean? They have a damn cop car on every corner. If folks been in New York, you'll notice they have literally police lookout towers on the corner in black neighborhoods. They rise 30 feet above the air and there's lookout towers in our neighborhoods. You know what I mean? So the racism that we've seen, it hasn't gone away. It's just gone on the ground. They don't burn a cross in front of your yard anymore, but they put a police car on the corner. They don't wear white robes anymore. They've taken those off, and now they wear black robes and they sit behind the bench. I'm saying that to say that the racism is systematic. It's systemic. It's pervasive. It's in our system. And the brothers and sisters I see every day who are hardworking, who are busting their butt just to make ends meet, they deserve so much better than what we're getting. And keep in mind, this is Shirley Chisholm's district, the district I'm running in. Shirley Chisholm, who said, if they don't give you a seat, you bring a folding chair. Folks in my in my community can't even afford a folding chair because our current representative has sold us out to the corporations. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about Yvette Clark. Let's, let's talk about it. her record a little bit, if you don't if you don't mind. Oh, let's speak on it. Yeah, I, I noticed that she takes a lot of corporate money, something that you are starkly against. Why for, for folks who don't know, the folks in the cheap seats, why doesn't Isaiah James say, why is he so hard on people taking corporate money? Why aren't you like, well, as long as you take the money and do good with it, James, Mr. James, why is that a problem for you? Okay, because I'm glad you asked that question because it's my job to explain that to people. Corporations don't give a damn about people. 
If they did, they wouldn't be corporations. They would be nonprofit organizations. They're not. They're in it to make money. That's number one. Number two, when you take that money from a Bank of America, what they want is anathema. It's against what I want as an everyday hardworking person. I want to be able to own my land, own a house, and build a house for my family. The bank wants to sell that land for a premium to a developer so they can build high-rise condos. When my opponent takes money from real estate developers, they don't want the single family home with somebody living in a basement apartment like I have. They want to build a 20-story building here and charge $2,700 a month for rent. When my opponent takes money from the defense industry, there's no defense industry in Brooklyn. Why is she taking that money? Guess what? There are eight recruiting stations in this district that's 50% African-American. So those black and brown bodies that go off to fight the war like I did, they come from Crown Heights. They come from Flatbush. They come from East Flatbush right here in this damn district. And also, that money, when it goes to the military industrial complex, what do you think they do with their, their surplus equipment? They sell it to police forces. We have an army, a navy, an air force, and a marine corps. Why the hell do police officers need tanks? They're not gonna, def what enemy are they defending from? They're not defending against an attack. They're, they're using it to police us, to keep us in check. So that's why it's so important. It's called integrity, the hard right over the easy wrong. The world I come from, the military world, when I told somebody my word, when I said, hey, you can go to sleep on this mountaintop in Afghanistan, I have your back, they literally had to put their life in my hands. And I had to do the same exact thing. And that that's how integrity was taught to me as a young pup growing up. I'm only 33, but that's how it was taught to me. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. If I say I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. And taking that money, we can never defeat that system by taking that money. When you or I walk into a store, I put a dollar on the counter. I want something in return. What the hell does Bank of America want to return? We saw what they did to the economy. What do the real estate developers want to return? What does the military industrial complex want to return? Whatever they want in return is not good for people in this community. Absolutely. You know, I, I didn't realize you were that young. Isaiah, yeah. uh, that height and size, man, you know, that, that <laughs> threw me off, man. And also, uh, the way that you speak was so much, at, you know, so adamant and committed in your speech as well. You're really sure about your place in the world and what you, you bring to it. Now, Yvette Clark, she, she agrees with Medicare for All, at least in words. So um, what would you say to her detractors and say, hey, Isaiah and, uh, and Clark have basically the same type policies. That so is absolutely should, not Why true. are we going to open ourselves up? Because I heard they've been scaring folks, saying yeah, that, you're going to split the vote. <laughs> First make, of all. Make your argument for why this ain't yeah. about splitting the vote. and why, This ain't about splitting the vote. Listen, we, listen, we have to stop voting for the lesser of two evils. All that does is still embolden evil. If another corporate Democrat gets in, all that does is say the next one can come along and get in. And we have the same failed system that we've had for 50, 60 years in this country. That's number one. Number two, Yvette Clark says she's for Medicare for all, but now that term has been co-opted. That doesn't mean any damn thing in this country. What does that mean? She takes hundreds of thousands of dollars from the pharmaceutical industry and the literally health insurance industry. And she sits on the Energy and Commerce Committee, which could bring a Medicare for all bill to the floor of the House right now. She ain't done that yet. And she's the co-chair of that committee. So think about that, number two. Number three, when we talk about health care, folks don't give a damn. Folks don't like their insurance. They like their doctors. They like the health care they receive. They're not like, yo, I really love my premium and my copay. No. They like their insurance. Out of the 33 industrialized nations in this world, 32 offer guaranteed health care. There's only one that doesn't. It's the United States of America. And we've been talking about this for 100 years in this country. It's the reason why you can go to the hospital for an IV. They can charge you $1,000. They can charge you $500 for a damn aspirin and $27 for a Band-Aid because we have a for-profit health care system. And anytime you commodify something, you're automatically saying that a certain subset of the population cannot participate in it. You know what I'm saying? So like a Ferrari is a commodity. I can look at it. I'll never be able to afford one. You're automatically saying to your fellow brothers and sisters, your countrymen, that some of you aren't going to be able to afford health care. So even before coronavirus hit, there were 35 million people who didn't have health care. Now... This upwards of 75 million who don't have health care. Maybe it's time for us to move away from this failed system that allows poor people and sick people and black people to die because they can't afford absorbent treatment. I'm for single payer health care in this country. 
Other countries have it. This is not a new idea. This is not a radical idea. This is something we can do in this country if we have the political courage. And lastly, I'm not splitting the progressive vote because I'm only progressive in this race. Mm. Isaiah for Congress.com, folks. Housing. Isaiah is a big advocate for housing. It must be an issue that's sorely needed or sorely needs to be addressed in New York, particularly Brooklyn. What's the housing crisis look like in New York? You had an epicenter of gentrification, man. Listen, our district, average income is 50000 Average two-bedroom apartment in our district is $2,800 mm. a month in this district. That is, that's literally 65 to 70% of your income spent just on housing. We're not talking about food, education, you know, luxuries, whatever. That's just housing. Folks can't afford to live in this district. People on black people who built this district aren't even being pushed to the margins anymore. They're being pushed off the map. It's the reason my folks don't live up here anymore. My father lived down in Florida because he can't afford to live in New York anymore. We need a World War II style massive investment in housing in this country. And we can do it. The money is there. We just saw them come up with $3 trillion out of nowhere. Mm. $3 trillion. Imagine if our leaders would have fought before coronavirus hit. Three trillion dollars for healthcare, or for housing, or for education, or for the mentally mentally ill, or or for cancer research, or any of these things. So we see the money is there, but the political will is not there. We need community land trust so the folks who built this community can own the damn land in this community and make sure it's affordable. We need housing co-ops, and we need a, a massive, massive investment in public housing. New York City, especially Central Brooklyn, has one of the highest proportions of public housing anywhere in this country. And we have something on the books called the Faircloth Amendment, which says that HUD, Housing and Urban Development, cannot use funds to build any new public housing in this country, which is unbelievable, mm. which is why our buildings are 50, 60, 70 years old and falling apart. My, my member of Congress has been silent on this issue. Now that an actual housing organizer is running against her, now she wants to wake up, but we don't need leadership that's going to be reactionary. We need leadership that's going to be proactive to head these things off at the past because we deserve so much more than just a platitude, a pat on the back, come here when it's time for an election, take a picture, and then bounce back out to Washington and nobody sees you for two years. Well, folks, I want to make sure that you realize that, you know, due to the pandemic, what we have is a an issue where we're not sure exactly what the turnout is going to be for the vote. So Nobody knows. That, that, that's a concern, but I also see it as an advantage in a way because the candidate I feel that gets the most excitement, that inspires voters more, will probably have those, have those voters be more active or actually come out and vote or actually mail in their voting ballots. You get what I'm saying? I think it's going to be all about energy, James. Isaiah, and I think you got that energy. In closing, my brother, what, what would be your last pitch? Someone's on the fence, they're choosing between you the brother that took that shady money from that organization or that pack, or the, the incumbent who's promising pretty much more of the same and some nice buzzwords to go with it. What would be your closing argument to that? My closing argument with them would be, now is the time. We cannot wait any longer for the problems that we are facing to be addressed, as is evident by everything you're seeing on TV. With coronavirus, with racial injustice, with housing, with education, with job loss, we cannot wait any longer. I would tell the person out there who's on the fence, listen, if you vote for the same, you're going to get the same. I understand that you're doing all these calculations and metrics, but I'm asking you right now to vote your conscience. Vote for the person who you know will stand up for your values. Because guess what? All it takes is one. And then one more and one more and one more. Each person knows 10 or 12 people. If they tell those people, listen, this cat Isaiah James is the real deal, then you will get me in office. And when you get me in office, you'll get yourself in office because I am a man of the people. I'm never running away. I'm not dealing in back rooms and smoke-filled rooms, the shady deals. I'm dealing with you, the people. Now is the time. The time demands so much more than what we've been getting. Incrementalism gets us the three-fifths clause. Literally, says I'm half a person. Incrementalism gets us separate but equal. Incrementalism gets us separate water fountains, separate buses. It never gets us to where we need to be. We need bold reformational change in this country. And I'm willing to fight for that on day one because I've been fighting for that my whole life. 
You're an inspiration, Isaiah James, and I'm so glad that you're running in this race. Folks, go to IsaiahForCongress.com. Support this candidacy. Let's do it right now while we have an opportunity. Thank you, Isaiah, for taking time out your schedule, my brother. I got your back. I don't bring everybody on this show because I only (laughs) bring on people that I believe in, brother. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If the news you watch makes you more confused after you watch it, watch the Tim Black Show and know what's going on. Go to patreon.com, Tim's Take Live. Join today.